Welcome to Dig Deep, the mining podcast. In this podcast, we go deep into mining news, hot topics, and live interviews with mining professionals and leading figures in the mining industry. Introducing your host, Rob Tyson, founder and director of Mining International and Mining International Executive, a leading global mining recruitment and headhunting agency. Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Danny Keating, who's the president and CEO of Guiani Metals, a robustry metal development uh, company focused on becoming one of Africa's first low carbon producers of high purity manganese sulfite monohydrate, uh, a precursor material used by lithium ion battery manufacturers for the expanding EV market. Um, and they're currently developing a portfolio of high quality manganese oxide assets uh, within the Cane Basin in southwest, uh, sorry, southeastern Botswana in Africa. Um, Danny's background is in both in engineering and commercial and accounting, uh, working in executive management for, for over 20 years. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about their recent um, capital fundraise of 26 million uh, US. Um, and plans for the, for the next 18 months as they finalise the uh, demonstration plant for producing high-purity battery-grade manganese uh, ready for offtake testing in Q4 um, and develop their defi definitive feasibility study, which is due out in the first half of 2025. So, Danny, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Rob. It's great to chat with you. Yeah, and yourself. As we always start these podcasts off, just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your background, about your career, so our audience knows a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your uh, your background. Sure, sure. So uh, um, I grew up in Johannesburg and uh, went to Wits University, mining engineer, as you mentioned, and um, worked underground and did, did, did a lot of work there. And then made my way through um, the South African mining houses, um, particularly with Anglo-American and, and different forms. Um, uh, principally also in the base metals division. So did a lot of work in zinc, lead, copper and, and the like. Um, and that gave me my first sort of foray into to kind of understanding um, a range of things. So from a production background, I, I then did all the, the sort of commercial side, the finance side and got a, a handle on, on kind of what I think are both sides of the business. Uh, did a few M&A transactions in the new business division. So that also gave me a flavor for things um, within that space. Um, one of the more interesting ones to be involved in was the Scorpion and, uh, Zinc Project in Namibia, uh, which is a hydromet process. And when we get to what we're doing at Guiani, that kind of fits in a bit uh, and understanding some of the complexities involved there in terms of what they were looking at. Um, so I spent some time there and then I'd, uh, I was working for the group in London at the time. And so got an opportunity in the early 2000s to to work in the city in London. Um, I was a, a research analyst and also did some corporate finance work at AB and AMRO and and uh, which was she was also with Ross Charles at the time. Um, and that was a huge experience, you know, so it was a bit of step out of the mining uh, sort of the Anglo world, uh, the big mining house where, you know, you learn your craft, you understand everything, well, not understand everything, but you've, you've learned things in a, in a great deal of detail, huge amounts of analysis. And then when you join the city, it's a very different, you know, broader spectrum of, of looking at all the assets that might not have been big mining company uh, sort of uh, profile because um, they just look at the, the tip of the iceberg sort of thing. And there's a whole world uh, in and around that. Um, and it's very exciting. And then um, uh, 2008 came along and I got offered the opportunity well into 2009 to, to, to co-found a, um, a bauxite business in Guinea in West Africa. Um, and that was an opportunity that was too good to pass up to sort of kind of start running and be involved in my own, uh, you know, your own business kind of thing and building that. Um, Guinea at the time was a country that just concluded a coup and was moving to, to a democratic leadership. Um, and bauxite at the time was not a very uh, high favoured uh, commodity uh, going into um, uh, the, the, the refining and, the, and, and in the smelting. Uh, very complicated and complex in terms of the product and, and selling. So got very, very adept at uh, explaining um, to investors and groups uh, when we finally got the funding to, to build that and, that and that project was built uh, and I went into operation. Uh, I departed the company, but it, it, it made its way to that, which was quite gratifying. Um, 
but it, it was a, a complexity around country, country management, uh, government, local community. It was a, it was quite the baptism of fire. Um, also, during that period, we had the Ebola outbreak uh, for two and a half years. So that also uh, was a whole new thing. So when we got the COVID outbreak, uh, I kind of had lived through something, not on a global scale, but certainly on an understanding of, of, of what might be required through that period. Um, and and also then, obviously, the other side of 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 understanding complex metallurgy, you've got to always understand what your client is doing and trying to explain it to investors. Um, so that was, I think, set me up well in a way for for, for the work we're doing in Guiani in terms of uh, new product, new environment. Uh, it, it's very high specification, uh, working with the customers that we need to work with. And then also less of an issue in terms of government, though. Um, this uh, Botswana is a fantastic jurisdiction to work in. So I at least have that um, that complication is is far less or removed, uh, given Botswana's kind of preeminent status. Um, and so uh, I sort of made my way from Bauxite um, and uh, developed a few projects in Guinea. And then um, I got the opportunity here uh, at Guiani to, to sort of be involved in the, the energy transition uh, and a business that was quite well developed, which is which was good because I historically sort of sort of started or founded companies and there's a lot of startup uh, frustration and, and, and things you have to go through. So Guiana was a great uh, a great joy to sort of start with with an existing team um, and uh, and and platform in place to sort of grow and develop from there. Um, one of you just tell us um, a little bit of a snapshot of Guiani uh, Metals and the story behind the company. Sure. Um, uh, essentially, a company that's way back when I think was looking. The name comes from a, a region in South Africa that, where the the company was looking for gold. Um, and like all good juniors, uh, navigated through that, then discovered manganese. And I think manganese that they were going to look at it in the steel industry and then migrated to realizing that this was a perfect product for for developing high purity manganese for the uh, for the, the battery industry. Um, and so that's the kind of evolution of the company. And, and, and what was what has been very successful is, is that a, uh, a new process has been uh, put forward. Uh, it's a hydromet process. It's very uh, low carbon. Uh, and why why is that important? Is historically a lot of the other production of this metal comes out of taking carbonate material and calcining. So in that process, uh, you're releasing a lot of CO2 units. Uh, and then it goes through some heavy industry and eventually ends up with electro winning again, which has very, very high energy associated with it. And, and typically, if you're in a a coal-fired environment, um, you know, that means a lot more CO2 units to produce the product. Um, so what we've focused on as a business is creating a process that takes oxide ores, um, so and you move straight through a hydromet process to come to final product uh, with a much lower CO2 sort of uh, footprint. Um, and, and that's been a, a huge uh, a sort of achievement of the business. And, and we'll discuss the demonstration plant, but that's the work we're doing with the demonstration plant uh, currently. Um, obviously, I mentioned in the introduction, uh, you recently uh, had a $26 million uh, fundraise uh, yeah. with two strategic institutions, Arch and the IDC. Why the fact are these two groups uh, having invested in Ghani, what, why is it, why is it uh, important uh, now for them to invest in yourselves? I think there's a, there's a number of angles. Firstly, um, historically, the company had raised money on market, um, which is just equity, and that's great. But the level of due diligence that you go through with you get a private equity group and the likes of the IDC as a strategic investor is profoundly greater. Right. So so we spent almost a year going through due diligence with these groups, which is a, a ringing endorsement when we get to the end and they, and they make a substantive investment. So 26 million US within the context of the current market where people are battling to find five million uh of, of you know or five or ten million it, it is is a huge step and i think the fact that we got through the due diligence process with them is is a key aspect of that so firstly um whilst whilst raising money on market is a lot easier in terms of you fill in some equity uh, some papers and, and and you issue shares and you get cash it's great um but we went through the process of a, of a large due diligence a lot of uh, uh documentation so it was a thorough process um, so that, that's important, I think, when we bring look at those groups in the in the in the sense of how they've been brought on board, uh, and then we have two different uh, sort of elements. So so Arch obviously is very focused on the ESG aspects. That's the nature of their fund, uh, sustainable development uh, sort of approach. Uh, so we're quite comfortable, and 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 you know that the fact that they've joined sort of uh, we also see as an accreditation. You know they've they've done their work in that regard. Um, 
and and through their investment that's obviously a focus that we have i mean we're a we're a group that's trying to assist in the the energy transition uh, and that's very important in terms of some of the sustainability aspects the green green metal if that's what you want to uh, we could define it as is, is what they're focused on so that was a that was a big endorsement the idc is is tremendous i mean uh, the industrial development corporation south africa is responsible over the last 60 80 years for some of the biggest developments within south africa and southern africa and providing that kind of funding at a time when um, business, uh, sort of nascent industries are trying to develop, which is exactly what the battery industry is and, and what we are as a company. It needs that kind of support. And what we like uh, and are, you know, it, it was time and effort with the IDC to get them on board is that their long term patient capital, which which every mining group wants. Right. Um, people who aren't banging the drum just about what the quarterly results say and and in and out on the stock price and this sort of stuff they're a group that, are, that that see the value of the project they want to see it successful and they want to see it developed uh, and and taken forward because they have a bigger strategy within southern africa in terms of the battery industry and how they want to see that developed um, so they're a, they're a huge um, um, genuine strategic investor um, which then obviously gives us opportunity when we come to the project financing to have two partners like that where you can go knock on the door and say look we this is this is the capital raise we need, uh, and if they're going to be supportive, and and that's part of why they have invested is not just for this phase; it's for the future phases. Um, you know, it gives us a, a solid platform to build a project financing um, uh, solution. Um, so, so, so those are the two groups that are, are. You know, it's been a huge, a huge positive for the business. Um, obviously, you mentioned the demonstration plant uh, that is due to be finished this year. Um, and the and what I suppose what are the key functions of it for uh, your takeoff uh, offtake process? Yeah, I mean the the demonstration plant I think sets us aside certainly in the in the in the high purity manganese the battery grade manganese industry just for the scale of what we're we're doing with the demonstration plant. Um, it truly is it's a one in ten engineering scale plant, um, which is in incredibly large uh, for what we're doing. Uh, and I think also across in a lot of the other sort of um, cobalt nickel plants that we've looked at, this is this is an incredibly large uh, facility. So it sets us apart. And why the 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 purpose of it is to to be able to firstly demonstrate the the process flow sheet. We need to sit with customers who are building uh, pre cam cam cell manufacturing and ultimately uh, car plants on the basis of a feed you know through the supply chain. And so all of that then requires that they have a credible, consistent and reliable provider of this raw, raw material input to, their, to, to all of that process. Um, and so when it comes to something of them looking and saying, well, have we de-risked the fact that this process is going to work? You're going to put variable ore in the front and out the back, we're going to get this product consistently every time um, so that they know they can make all their plans, they can build all their factories and, and downstream um, works. Uh, they have to have that confidence. And so that's what the demonstration plant in its first instance gives. It's, it's, it's that um, uh, process. It also gives them, because it's a continuous process, so we're not just doing batches because um, we had a comment back. We did we we produce product in our pilot phase, and we got the the comment back that you know you can produce anything in a lab, um, and this is this is a real life kind of project uh, uh, and 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 plant, and so once we can demonstrate that we can produce that product, we then have the chance to put that in their hands, and now they're able to sort of say yes, you meet our technical specification, but now we can do the testing. We can actually start putting it through, making. Uh, cathode activated material with it we can then also put it into batteries and, and um, uh, we, we've visited a few um, sites recently some battery uh, plants where we saw them testing batteries and going through uh, the, the incredible level of, of test work that they need to do uh, and we're encouraged that we want to make sure that you know next time we visit there some of our manganese is, is sitting in some of those batteries and that's that's where you can only do that and give them that comfort once you have that scale of plant that's producing uh, on a continuous basis um, and, and delivers product into into their their system because they've got to test uh, test and test again, but then also make batteries and then test that the the, the nature of the product is working well in the batteries. Um, and so uh, you know that's a that's it's a huge undertaking for us as a as a junior. I mean, normally juniors do a a, a DFS, you know, right? you do your feasibility study. And that's about it. And then you run off and build it. And then you you have a huge teams of people doing that. Um, 
you know, we're, we're in a position where we're doing uh, the feasibility study, but we're also building a plant. Uh, it's it's a significant undertaking um, and, and, and does take up a lot of our time, effort and the money that we've raised. Um, but it, it, it's the game changer. It is the uh, that, that uh, we're looking forward to the end of the year when we have first product out and then what it means for offtake uh, discussions into next year is profoundly different. Uh, you know, kind of green lights the project and everyone kind of looks and goes, well, if you've got the IDC back and, you, and your plant works and your process works and you're already talking to the customers and they like the project and the product, it's kind of like you, you're kind of looking and saying, well, we're now at that point where kind of, I don't want to say nothing can stop us, but we're now on the path where it's all in our hands, all in our control, and now we've just got to go through those those steps of executing. Um, and I think that's an important timeline for our shareholders uh, who are long suffering in terms of our share price. Um, I appreciate, um, but but that's the point they're looking for when we, we, we think now that's when the market will probably start to really realize the value of this company. Um, the definitive feasibility study, which is obviously due out first half of uh, 2025 yeah. um, and the work streams uh, you're working on, obviously to ensure operational costs are, are obviously kept low as possible. Um, and the carbon content of the product is low as possible. Um, just wonder if you can uh, comment on that. Sure. So the, the DFS, um, the feasibility study, will include all the learnings that we can from the plant. So we want to make sure that that document includes, uh, you know, the real life test work. So um, what what agitators should uh, speeds we should have, what size vessels we should have. So we're, we're hoping we can also do some optimization, right? So once you've learned and been able to test on the scale that we have in the demonstration plant, we should be able to optimize within the feasibility study. So when normally engineering teams would look and say, we're gonna size vessel X and then we'll put this, you know, safety factors on, we can sort of say, no, no, it can be this size because we know it needs to be that size within the safety uh, sort of factors of what's needed. So so that that impacts our operating costs, uh, sort of the capital costs and making sure we right size that. And then obviously understand in a, in a great deal of detail, maybe more than you would normally have in a feasibility study what your reagent consumptions are and 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 what those operating costs are going to look like um so that's that's important so all that data flows through and is part of that study uh, and means that when we're talking to project finance um uh, financiers and in, in terms of debt banks lenders they have the comfort that the numbers are fresh up to date and also supported less by let's say academic um or or industry standard practice before, like, oh, this is what's happened before. This is this is based on real life data. Um, you know, this this is how it works in, in a plant scale down. We've got to scale it up, but it's it's real life data. So that's that's a huge de-risking element, I think, for uh, a business where we all know there's risk around uh, the product. You know, in a lot of these battery metals, there's there's a lot of there aren't easy to find uh, quoted prices. Um, and so in an area where we have that, we know that will be a challenge. That's part of our offtake uh, discussions. But what we're very conscious of is de-risking and de-risking this business as much as we can. So in the field currently, we did a lot of drilling to make sure we have measured resource over the, the life of loan, life of the project. So that when bankers look at this and they go, is there any risk? You know, while well, we've got our loan out in terms of the resource, no, we've tried to eliminate as much risk as we can there. What do we have in the plant? Well, is there a risk around the process? Well, hopefully it's been totally de-risked because we've proved it. What do we have around the product and the customers? Well, here's the offtake because we've de-risked it there. So it's this constant process we're going through to make sure that we de-risk everything that's within our power to de-risk. Um, and then at the end of the day, when we look at you know where the market's moving in terms of the price of the product, uh, obviously we're hoping that it's as high as possible. Um, but that's ultimately what the equity investors are looking for, right? They want to be involved in an environment where hopefully the prices are moving up um, and that improves the value of the company that they're buying into. And um, and that's where, you know, if you're buying into a copper company, that's that's the risk you want to have, right? Is that price volatility and that's where, where valuations move and, and your share price goes up and you make money. Um, and so we want them to be focused on that, which is the right place, rather than worrying about um, does the plant, something in the plant work we want to make is make give them the comfort that that's been de-risked and taken away um you've recently attended uh, obviously many conferences including uh being in washington and a fast markets uh, conference groups have obviously been showing interest and what why why do you think they've been targeting uh those sort of groups and uh, and those conferences for for meetings um i know you also you also uh at uh, pdac and in darba as well so yeah, just wondered if you could uh, uh, tell us a little bit about those conferences and 
and and how they went. Sure. No, it's been uh, the, the, quite a busy time in terms of those conferences. They are um, uh, the two in particular that you mentioned. There was in DC, um, and and then we also had the one out in Las Vegas, which was the big battery conference. Um, so the one was fast markers, the other one benchmark. Um, the DC one was, as you can imagine, had a huge political um, sort of angle to it. In fact, uh, Joe Manchin, who's the um, senator from West Virginia and the head of the Senate um, uh, Committee on Energy, uh, who, who actually was responsible for putting the IRA legislation in place. That's his legislation. Um, uh, he spoke at the conference uh, and there's a lot of members from the State Department, from the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, uh, all very focused there. So it's in DC and that's and that's what they wanted to sort of be involved in. Um, and there's a huge policy initiative uh, within DC to, to sort of look at the industry um, and, and try and support it. And obviously the focus for them is, um, and, and I think this was critical we picked up, is that the, the discussion around EVs, batteries and things, I think historically had maybe been somewhat contentious around uh, the, the questions around climate change. Um, and there was the, the, there's a fractious debate in America on that. But what came through more was that everyone was more concerned by the strategic nature of, of national security, that America doesn't want to have a situation where um, its supply chains, its manufacturing is dominated by effectively China or want any other group. They want to make sure that they onshore manufacturing in, in, in the US. They bring all this technology to, to the US or to its partners around the world and make sure that they have a, a diversity in the supply chain. So A, establishing a, um, an international supply chain and making sure America has a strong role in it uh, that goes through to the manufacturing of these products, through to their defense. And so I think that's a big um, point, you know, when we look at this sort of the nature of this transition is how the American uh, sort of um, a political system is now looking at this. This is about national security. It's about developing these these factories, these uh, these operations within within the American sort of sphere of influence. And that's hugely important because for our business, when we look at it, um, we have and, and, and what we, we I think makes it a fantastic business is three points of of growth in the revenue line which is not usual for, for mining businesses. So we have the growth within EV and stationary batteries, which is, which is despite sometimes when we see it tap off a bit, it's, it's slower, it's still big growth, but it's maybe slower than anticipated, but it's, it's a fantastic growth. And then across that, we see manganese being used in more of the battery uh, chemistry. So uh, historically we had the lithium iron phosphate batteries, which didn't have manganese in them. And there was this move to the nickel cobalt manganese batteries, which is a much better uh, energy storage. It's a much better chemistry for batteries. Um, and now what we're finding is so everyone gravitated to that, but now that, what was the LFP is now having manganese in it. So it's moving to a, a lithium manganese iron phosphate battery. So we just look, and, and part of what we're testing at the demonstration plant, and that's another reason to have a fantastic facility like that, is we're looking at all these different products. And we're sort of saying, we're not just going to, not just focus on one. How can we produce all of the products that are required for all these battery uh, chemistries and make sure we can supply and service those customers? Um, and and I think that um, so when we look and sort of say manganese is in all is in the battery chemistries, rising levels of manganese use. So even in the NMC batteries, we used to see less manganese. It was with high nickel. Now we're moving to what they call mid nickel. So it's less nickel but more manganese. So more manganese is great for us. Um, the manganese that's being in the in the the, the the LMFP side of things. So so we get EVs taking off growth, more manganese. So it's a higher intensity of use of manganese in those chemistries. It's fantastic. And then back to the geopolitics that we sort of looked at, you know, the vast majority, 90 plus percent of this material has historically been made in China. Um, and it doesn't look like the US or and, and discussion we have in Europe is there's going to be much wavering about the idea that we need to establish this production outside of China, in effect, you know, in the Western world. And so there's a third part of that is that we have to develop and grow this entire supply in in an environment where there is none currently or very little. Um, so that's three elements where you look and saying what's good for um, uh, it's great for Guiani. It's also great for the for for those players in the in the um, the, the, the manganese high purity manganese business. But we've got those those elements working with us and as one maybe drops down a bit and chemistry kicks up or the geopolitics, you know, all three of them working in tandem means we've got a, we're very comfortable. They've got a very secure revenue line that's going to grow quite well over the next five to 10 years. 
Um, looking at the OEMs um, and obviously the battery makers, they're looking to, I suppose, move towards lowering nickel, uh, remove cobalt and increase ma- manganese content. Um, just wanted me to just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So it just comes down to cost. So within those three elements that are all essential, you can't get rid of uh, any one of them kind of thing. You need to have different balances, but and you get different battery performance um, depending on that that combination. Um, but I think what what there's sort of a, a move in the direction of, and again, this is um, this is this is speaking to the, the the PhDs and the and the, the the really smart people in the world who are designing all this chemistry. Um, but there seems to be an appreciation that um, uh, obviously the nickel is expensive, as is the cobalt. That there are ways of getting the same battery performance um, on a cost-effective basis by using more manganese as opposed to the other two and, and, and getting a better mix. Um, and so that's encouraging to us. Um, so, so this, yeah, they, they, there was ESG concerns about also some of the cobalt through the DRC, but we have new, more production coming out of Indonesia, so that maybe counterbalances that slightly. But that's a concern. So, when we look at it, we're trying to sort of say, um, um, how do we service our customer best? Is by not only giving them a on spec, uh, you know, product that 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 they need. But also, can we help them in the other areas so that if they have to take some other product like nickel, it's maybe higher CO2. If we have the lowest possible CO2 um, uh, pr- product in manganese, that helps us offset some of the overall CO2 units uh, within the battery. Um, we make sure that we're, we're observing the highest uh, social, uh, environmental and governance uh, aspects. We're in Botswana. It's a fantastic country to make sure that that meets the highest standards that maybe helps offset some of the other issues they have with some of the other products um so what we're trying to do is give them a product that meets low carbon good you know fantastic esg uh, on spec uh, so that at the end of the day this is a product of choice so if they're looking and saying well and it's hopefully lower cost than well maybe not maybe we'd like it to be as as expensive as cobalt and nickel one day but it also offers them a cost differential so it's more than just cost we're adding all these different elements that say this is why you'd want this product and you'd want to use more of it. And 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 and, and uh, uh, within the market currently, without there being more Western production um, of high purity manganese, we need to develop the credibility of that supply. Certainly. Um, obviously, we're looking at the manganese cycle um, at the moment. And obviously, there's comparisons to uh, lithium five years ago. And obviously, your Ghani are obviously in a strong position uh, to be one of the most developed groups uh, that is obviously likely to get the project built. But obviously it takes time and money and obviously working out the process to make sure that the high purity manganese is uh, is obviously produced from your from your process. Yeah. Um, how would you say the likely is the comparison to the lithium five years ago uh, as you see it now? Yeah, I think we... We've noticed certainly in the last year a growth in terms of uh, new entrants into the space. Uh, let's say uh, you know other competitors and and within the peer group. So I think when we look at lithium, to your point, is you know you go back ten years, you probably find there was a few majors in it and a few juniors involved. It was a very small uh, industry. Uh, they could probably all meet in one place in one restaurant kind of thing, and and that would be it. And then now, you know, lithium is three or four hundred companies that are involved in the space. It's very active. Uh, lots of projects coming on board and um, so we've definitely seen a growth in that so I think lithium went from relative obscurity to being a very very high profile commodity Um, we saw the the change in the price which was um, you know was exceptional at times I know it's retreated uh, down Um, but but you know we do see some similarities in the sense of people waking to the idea that there is a, a shortage of potential supply in high purity manganese um, that there is a uh, only a, f- a few groups involved, um, and and so we are seeing more entrants. So there's, there's a lot of similarity there, and I think what for us uh, our drive is to sort of stay ahead of the market. We are ahead of the market. Uh, raising money for demonstration plants and and feasibility studies is difficult. So that gives us since we have our money and even uh, you know maintains our advantage um, going forward, um, and you know we we. We, we we we're conscious of of when you are ahead of of as I say of of, of that staying ahead of, of the pack. Um, so um, yeah, I think that's it. I mean, we did see a massive change um, in in lithium, 
and a lot of players. We, we may be hoping there aren't as many uh, players in the market. But from our side, what we're also conscious of is there is a bit of an open space since there aren't existing producers. I think in lithium, there were bigger players out of Chile and, and different areas that were already in the space. But we don't have those Western world suppliers at the moment. So, you know, our target is to, if we're at the front of this race, uh, to, to be able to be that um, that leading producer, that producer that all the customers know can develop the project. And as we move forward through construction of the main project and, and into production, um, that we would maybe be, once we've gone through the, the full accreditation with OEMs, which is not a small process, that when they come to say, well, we need more product, that we will be the group that they'll reach out to. So we want to try and maintain that leadership, not just now, but all the way through in terms of the development of the project, because we think there is an opportunity in that that bigger sense of being the the dominant player in 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 the space uh, in the western uh, in the western hemisphere yeah and lastly uh what's the sort of short to medium term outlook for giani metals um and i suppose what's the the plan of action from now to the end of the year uh hopefully before uh reaching that first production stage yeah that's where the, the key focus is uh so from the demonstration plant complete the construction commissioning and get first product out and 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 deliver to a customer um but but first product this year uh not a small undertaking and not without its its stresses and strains i, I must admit it's uh, we are building a even though it's a, a small plant uh, there's you know it's still the same kind of effort as a big plant uh, so it's um it's quite an undertaking so but that's a that's a big key deliverable for the business um there's no doubt so so that's what we're focused on Alongside that, we, we've done the, the field works. We're preparing for the feasibility study, which will need all of the, the data to be integrated with it uh, through the beginning of next year. But we're doing all of the background, the, the data gathering, the field works, all that we need to do on that front. So there's a bit of news flow out of that. Um, but the, the key news flow from the DFS would be next year. Um, and and then, on, of course, what we're doing is permits and licensing in countries. So we've just secured the uh, surface rights. We put a news release out on that just recently. That's a fantastic achievement. So we now have the exclusive right to, to all of the surface uh, um, and some of the subsurface uh, water rights, etc. Uh, in that area, it's over a thousand uh, hectares of land. So we have a lot of space for for all the infrastructure we want to put in place. Um, and, and that's a huge, you know, we know a no, number of companies have issues with getting that uh, land title and land access. Um, and at a very, very modest cost, you know, we just uh, uh, within the land lease structure within Botswana is, is very well regulated, very well understood and very well documented. So so that's been an, uh, a great pro uh, sort of process. Again, goes to the heart of operating in Botswana and, and the, the straightforward nature of it uh, and the speed with which we're able to achieve things. Um, so we have that. And then we also have the mining license, which is currently under review. Uh, with the Ministry of Mines or the Department of Mines and the Ministry. So we're hoping to have some announcements on that in the short term. Um, so that's the other angle, right? So we have the permits and licensing, the DFS and the demonstration plant all the way through to the to the offtake. So an exciting uh, exciting uh, 12 months ahead of us in terms of delivering on all these these aspects, yeah. Yeah. Danny, really appreciate your time. Thank you for obviously giving us an overview um, and outlook for uh, uh, Giani Metals and... If our audience wants to reach out to you, if they want to obviously follow the story, obviously watch the progression of the of the plant being built and obviously looking at that first first production. How can they how can they go about following uh, your story and the company's well, story? The, the usual things, obviously, on the website, they can link in and, and obviously will um, obviously be able to register and, and receive all the flow of information. We're on uh, LinkedIn. We're also on Twitter so people can uh, follow us there. Uh, and uh, if necessary, that um, in our press releases, my contact details are there and people can ping me an email or to our business uh, business development and corporate development, uh, Charlie uh, Fitzroy. Uh, you f feel free to reach out to him too. Um, there's also a telephone number if people want to call on there, but but email X and, uh, uh, sorry, I call it Twitter, it's X <laughs> um, and, and LinkedIn uh, is, is easy ways to get hold of us and we can respond to, to any questions. Yes, and we include those all obviously all in the show notes to come in this uh, episode. Um, well, wish you the well of uh, wish you all the best for for the remainder of the year, and hopefully we can get you on the podcast maybe in January, February next year, and obviously let us know how how everything went. Fantastic, Rob. Thanks for, yeah. for having a chat. It was great, great chatting with yeah. you. Yeah, and yourself. Um, hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, like, like always, really appreciate your uh, continued support. Please keep sharing this episode far and wide. As I always say, not just with people within our mining industry, but people outside of our mining industry. We do want to spread the word 
of and and I suppose promote our promote our industry uh, for those people outside of mining, so they understand what what happens within our industry. Um, it's an exciting industry to be in, um, and as Danny has just uh, alluded to, um, a lot of work goes into producing these these materials for the uh, the, the green economy that is coming. So thank you for listening, and until next time. Happy mining. Thank you for listening. Remember to reach out to Rob via the show notes and be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, happy mining, helping each other to improve the mining industry.